Welcome to the Cisco Telepresence VCS System Configuration Video Guide. Again, my name is Michael McGarry, Product Manager within the Cisco Telepresence Systems Business Unit. This is the continuation of six videos which will guide you through the basic configuration of a VCS. Welcome to Part 4, Maintenance. So, again, we're going to start with the VCS in the System Overview space, and we're going to go to Maintenance and Upgrade. This is where we can upgrade software on the VCS. We also have additional components that can be upgraded, not just the base configuration of the VCS, but also the OCS Relay VCS database, uh, as well as the device provisioning database, can actually be independently upgraded. And we see the associated versions. Underneath option keys, we can add additional option keys. Uh, currently, we have 100 non-traversal calls, 100 traversal calls and 2500 registrations. The 2500 registrations is not an option key. It's actually built into the VCS directly. And what we do have though is we do have 100 traversal calls and this comes standard with the VCS control. What does not come standard with the VCS control is 100 non-traversal calls. Uh, this is typically uh, default is 10 and um, I've actually added an option key for 100 non-traversal calls. I could add some additional traversal call or non-traversal calls and just by adding the option key here and add option. If we wanted to turn find me or device provisioning off on this VCS, what we can do is we can actually tick box these and delete them. We do have to restart the VCS after option changes. Let's go on. We have cer security certificates. Uh, I'm going to skip this section if you understand what you are doing with certificates and X509 uh, server-side certificates as well as client certificates, then this is a great place for you to exercise uh, your knowledge. Otherwise, we're going to continue on to languages. Uh, the VCS is possible to actually upload additional language pack files that, are com that come from Cisco. So we can actually change the default configuration here, and we can um, use the browser's configuration, or we can actually tell it what type of uh, language we wanted to use for this particular connection. We're going to go on and we have login accounts. Login accounts are for administrative purposes. Underneath the configuration, we can actually use remote authentication servers. The remote authentication servers that the VCS supports directly is LDAP server or an open LDAP server, as well as Microsoft's variant uh, of LDAP, Microsoft Active Directory. If we do want a remote authentication server, we will need to configure the LDAP configuration parameters. This can be viewed in the VCS Administrator Guide, and you can actually go through and understand how to configure this. Otherwise, if we continue with login accounts and go to user accounts, this is where Find Me users are created. In this case, I only have one Find Me account listed on this particular VCS, and if I click View Edit this particular account, then I can actually take and click Edit User, which opens up an additional screen and it's a pop-up dialog box. And here's where I have multiple different devices that I've got configured. I may want to add an additional configuration, so I may want to add an additional device for this particular user, and that device may be a telephone. So in this case, if I wanted to dial a office phone, and I dial a service prefix to get to the Cisco Unified Communications Manager from here, so that might be 88 in this case, and then I have an office extension as well. So I'm going to go ahead and close. And now I can edit my office configuration. And when my endpoint is busy, then I'm going to ring my office phone. Or if I don't answer my endpoint, then I'm going to also dial my office phone after 60 seconds. Once I've saved that, it will add the office phone to here as well as to when not answered. I'm going to go ahead and close this. And we're going to go on to Backup and Restore. Backup and Restore is a section where we can actually create a system backup file for this particular VCS. Uh, this is very helpful if you are going to upgrade and you're going to test upgrading to uh, the next major version of code. You may want to create a system backup file so that you can restore it if you want to revert back to a previous version. It is possible to create a system snapshot. A system snapshot is used by TAC as well as our engineering department to be able to understand things that might be going wrong with the VCS. So 
TAC may actually ask you to create a system snapshot, and this is where you do so. Underneath incident reporting, we have a configuration, and this is by default turned off. I would strongly suggest that you turn on this configuration parameter. If you turn this on, this sends incident reports or crash reports to our VCS error reporting uh, server. This allows us to actually identify things that are happening in the field that we may not see in our QA labs and under testing conditions. And we can actually then fix those things that are going on out in the field in future versions of software. But if we don't know about um, something that's not working correctly, then it's hard for us to fix that. So this is where this comes very useful. So I would suggest that you turn this to on and then save it. If there has been a crash, that will be in the incidents. So you can click View Incidents. This particular VCS doesn't have any crash reports, so therefore we don't have anything listed in the incidents. There are a number of different tools. Uh, there's a check pattern utility that we can use for checking regular expressions. And this is where we would add a pattern string and then maybe even a place string if we were um, replacing. And then we can do a test pattern up here and then check the pattern and it will test it. Uh, what's helpful to also know is that this particular code um, uses the same code base that the VCS search functions use when actually processing calls. So this is using the exact same search function inside of the device. Underneath maintenance there's a couple other things. We can actually go to locate and this is where we can test to see if we can actually find an endpoint. In this case, I might want to run a test here, so let me add a test, and I'm going to try dialing um, my own endpoint at my home office, and I'm going to use the H.323 protocol. I've changed the hop count to 15 because I think 5 is not going to make it all the way through, and I'm going to turn authenticated off, and I'm going to tell it that it looks like it's coming from the local zone. I can even specify a source alias, so I may want to actually specify uh, mgary.check at uh, cisco.com. And so let's go ahead and test a locate command on this VCS. And we're going to search, and we do actually have a true. It did come back true, and it did complete. There is a call serial number associated with this, and we can actually go down through here and look and see what actually happened to that particular call via the various different search mechanisms that we've already put on place on this particular VCS we've got a number of different searches that occurred um, however one that did occur was the search rule 2 which is the TSBU alpha any alias so I actually sent this to a neighbored zone and the neighbored zone actually returned back a true I would have to go to the remote zone here and see what it did and see where it actually found this particular endpoint But it did return back a true, and our protocol, since we started with H323, actually returned back true on 323. But if we go up here, we can actually see that we did a local zone match, which is that any alias that we had configured, um, actually that was configured by default. We tested to see if that alias was in the local zone under H323, and then we tested to see if it was a SIP client as well after we did not find it in 323 and then of course the next obvious um, pattern match would have been the um, search rule 2 here which is the TSBU alpha any alias search rule and then we sent it to the TSBU alpha VCS control very uh, helpful little tool for finding things also there is a port usage page this is very helpful for usually the VCS expressway um, but we're going to look at this for the VCS control as well we have local VCS inbound ports, and this tells us what each of the ports are used for on the box. Um, we see a number of different ports that are used for the TMS agent diagnostics, LDAP administration, as well as data replication. And we also see the media port ranges that were configured for the interworking calls, uh, the traversal calls, as well as the SIP ports. We have 5060 UDP, 5060 TCP, as well as 5061 TCP, and of course 5061 is the TLS uh, port. Uh, we also have a number of other ones as well configured. Um, the cluster um, communication port is actually uh, 4369 to 4380, 
and those are not configurable. There's an IPsec Security Association Setup port, which is port 500, uh, and that's used for cluster replication, uh, cluster setup anyway, and then cluster replication port is actually uh, SSH over at port 22. And we have a number of other things here configured as well. What we do not see here is we do not see HTTP port 80. If we had the uh, port 80 uh, HTTP uh, website enabled, then we would also see HTTP here and listed at port 80. Um, underneath the port usage and outbound ports, these are the source ports that are used by this particular VCS control. And you can see that uh, we have a number of different source ports for the various different types of communication. We also have remote listening ports. So these are what the remote devices that we will be using or communicating with actually need. And here's where we will see the alpha, uh, the TMS servers, a remote listening port that needs to be opened uh, as well as we have a number of different things for a number of different uh, devices. Of course uh, for NTP we see port 53 which is used for NTP uh, time server I'm sorry for DNS and we see 123 for NTP and of course those are UDP. Now underneath uh, the maintenance we also have a restart and a reboot. A restart just restarts the application, brings it down to the Linux kernel, and then back up again. This is a much faster restart than a, an entire system reboot. An entire system reboot actually does a power on self-test, uh, so it actually brings the box all the way down and then actually does a power cycle on the box itself and reboots the system and brings the system back up. This takes much longer to run, uh, but you can actually take and reboot the system as well. And of course, we do have a shutdown. Um, I would not suggest that you use shutdown unless you're physically in front of the VCS, because you will not be able to power this box back on remotely. You have to push the button in the back of the box. Thank you for joining us for part four of maintenance. Next, we will go on to status.